Welcome to Practical Female Psychology, Episode 3, Chapter 2, Female Neuropsychology. For centuries, women have been more advanced in knowledge of male sexual neuropsychology. Women needed such skills for physical survival in a world dominated by large, aggressive men. Women are usually totally silent about their deep knowledge of male psyche and sexuality. We believe this silence is a result of 1. The female need to manipulate the male into a provider role for reasons of survival and 2. The female need for social acceptance or social status preservation when promiscuity is punished. This refers to the Madonna whore complex which is extensively discussed later in the book. I'm going to push back on them here. It turns out this has been talked about in a lot of the Evo Psych stuff. I believe Jeff Miller actually has this in his book, where it used to be that way. Paleolithic times, the idea was women were manipulative and guys were manipulated. But then occasionally, if a guy caught on to it, then they would be able to use their brute strength to win the day. And so it was this arm's length between manipulation and detection. And what ended up coming out of this is self-deception. I talk about this extensively in my book, but it's not a lie if you actually believe it. It turns out if uh, you get a bunch of guys who are socially calibrated and then have a decent social savviness to them, you're able to tell when somebody is lying to you, unless you're greedy or ego invested in the lie. But in that case, you're lying to yourself. Point I'm getting at here is in those situations, it turns out the best way for somebody to lie is to actually believe in their own lie. That way there's no tells, there's no visual representation of a lie. You don't have to keep things separate in your mind. A girl can just go with the flow and make it perfectly natural. So as much as they say here that girls have it as a psychological adaptation, he kind of infers that it's conscious here. And I would argue it's basically unconscious, which is another reason why you just can't take girls too seriously because they know not what they do. But hey, in the odds that uh, a tiger is going to come and attack her, having you around and thinking you're the greatest man in the world is probably the best thing for her. So, I mean, you can use it to your advantage as well. So they put a little footnote in this thing, which is kind of interesting too, where they say that uh, this stuff should be taught in schools. And if it was, there'd be a lot of relationship that lasts a lot longer than the nonsense they're feeding him now. We always call that the Disney fantasy. And second part, the reason, at least within the modern times, that guys are woefully inept on this is that it's socially taboo to talk about sex because women have that need not to be thought of as slutty. And, you know, they're teachers, they're politicians, same as anybody, but they make it essentially taboo to talk about this stuff openly. They may not see it that way. They may have some total frontal lobe justification for it, but at its core, it's a way of hiding female sexuality as a way of giving women power. Remember, a lot of this stuff isn't so much Machiavellian masterminds hiding in a war room with like the evil Illuminati. It's just people running off their hard wiring. And it just so happens that girls were ex exceptional at lying to themselves and girls who were exceptional about keeping guys in the dark about what makes them tick, the better off they were. And those ones ended up making a bunch of cave babies. And here we are stuck with this now where you can either think of women as damaged men that lie constantly, or you can think of women as women who just talk and use language the way they use it. And if you look at them like a guy, you'll see them as a liar, but they're not men, they're women. So language and female arousal is a really neat section. It's a very small one here. And the big part to take away from it is women are attracted by words. Men are attracted by visual. This is another reason where the sex, or another place where the sexes are different. If you look at what the most popular things are for women when it comes to sexual excitement, it's literature. It's Fifty Shades of Grey. It's Harlequin romance novels. You look at guys, what's the most erotic thing they have? It's essentially Pornhub on their phone while they're sitting on the toilet pinching one out. But that's the point. You can't think of the sexes as interchangeable. They're not. Women are attracted to language. And the psychological reason for that is that when women are talking and using words, which is again, something that's not quite the same between men and women, but that talking actually gives a dopamine response. That's some girls can sit there having brunch, jabbering on for hours a day. Meanwhile, guys would find it absolutely exhausting. For a girl, she gets off on it. In the same way that a guy just looking at girls playing volleyball, wearing very, very loose bras is probably gonna be something they can handle doing all day. Again, women, linguistic, men, visual. Keep that in the back of your mind. 
So they expand on this one too, talking about uh, female sexual arousal. And it's probably one of the most common things you hear of where the opposite of love isn't hate, it's apathy, or emotions don't have to be negative or positive, just strong. Most of the guys who've done pick up even as far back as mystery and before have all known this. But this is the this is the scientific backing, I guess, so this is the best way to put it. It's pleasure in their case, dopamine responses. They come from either positive responses, such as joy, or negative responses, such as anger, which is why sometimes things like nagging actually like have been quite effective and extremely vilified. It just turns out getting a girl a little pissed off at you when there's any sexual attraction there doesn't exactly shoot you out. A girl being angry means she can be angry at you, but that also means she can be attracted to you. The thing guys tend to worry about is when a girl is dismissive or condescending, because that's usually the sign that she's not attracted to you. Anger, you can work with that. To quote, even when women try to be men, they have the urge to talk a lot. It's a hormonal rush that men don't get. Now, hormonal responses seem aligned with situations that involve communication. This is why men don't have the same understanding of communication as they don't get the dopamine from it. That's the key point here. You got to think about that. There is, I want to say, this happened about like five years ago. It was right at the beginning of the red pill, the subreddit in there. There was this guy on there. His username was something like uh, Kako7 or something like that. Anyways, he actually kind of got off on what you would consider to be the worst parts of hypergamy. A girl's treating him bad, a girl's cheating on him, all that stuff. Really sucked for him. But the one thing that was really great in those early days of the space before the autism took over was he got off on all the worst parts of uh, female sexual strategy. And so he was able to articulate it to a level you didn't understand. Now, think about the lengths guys go to for sex. Basically, whichever device gets porn wins. That's how beta lost to VHS. That's how DVDs won out. That's how um, Blu-ray beat out HD DVD. Porn basically runs guys' thoughts process and they can build technology surrounding it. In fact, it's been argued that the reason we have high-speed internet right now and you can watch this thing is basically because Pornhub needed the pipes and guys needed the porn. Now, consider that thirst and that driving power that thirst builds and put that towards language. And that's how women understand language. Charles Bukowski, Jordan Peterson, Neil Strauss. I like these guys. Add some salt to cover up the bitterness of middle-aged soccer moms and put in the oven for 45 minutes. Optionally, you can take from all this stuff what you want and leave the rest. Next section is mutual gazing, where they talk about prolonged eye contact. It actually builds a slight dopamine response in a girl as well. Again, these are those alpha characteristics. This is why if a girl maintains eye contact with you for more than a second, it's usually seen as a display of higher value. Uh, prolonged contact with the eyes is an important part of socialization. So to quote here, when a female is deprived of mutual gazing, she gets anxious and depressed. Conversely, when she is rewarded by mutual gazing, she gets pleasure and is satisfied. You might have noticed that your wife or girlfriend will become increasingly agitated when your eyes are focused intently for any length of time on a television sporting event or towards your computer screen. Again, a lot of guys think it's just a girl nagging, a girl wanting attention. It's almost like a drug addict looking for a fix. They want that eye contact, they want that focus, they want that attention. Again, Remember this, because in some later episodes, we're going to talk about the betaization of men and the betaization process. And this one here is a key component of that. Remember, it's not that girls hate sports. They just seek comfort through prolonged eye contact. Now, this isn't going to say that if a girl's not into you, you can just stare at her from across the bar for seven seconds like an autist, and then all of a sudden she's going to fall for you. Without the initial attraction there, this doesn't work. Again, rewards are only work if you're attractive already. And if you're attractive in her eyes, the kind eye contact is good. If you're not, don't do it. And I really should put this as a don't eat paint warning, but that's not this video, that's a different one. Anyways, ultimately, women are attracted by masculine features. Therefore, men who reward women with lots of feminine traits, such as conversation and mutual gazing though, 
are at the risk of having those females lose attraction for them in the long run. These men risk becoming too effeminate in the eyes of their women. Calibration is therefore critical. You will need to listen and observe and therefore determine the right amount of these things. Again, understand womanese, speak in Manglish. There's an old post from Mary Red Pill. We talk about that often. Just remember, this stuff works. The comfort building stuff, it's good. But too much of it kills attraction. You want just enough comfort that the anxiety that comes with the alpha or like attractive traits don't cause an extreme anxious breakdown and the girl to basically not want to stick around. Which is, funnily enough, why there's a subset of guys who are actually having problems with girls, but not in the way most guys are. Most guys have a problem just attracting a girl, have a problem with a girl losing sexual interest in them over a while, but there's actually some guys who I call uh, too much alpha. They have built up tons of anxiety in their girls. They're super hot, they're attractive, they're aloof. The girl totally wants to sleep with them, but she can never stick around. She always acts like agitated and they can never get that second date and it's always just smash, 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 and move on. And these are the guys that need little things like this, these little comfort tells, because these are how you end up building a relationship or at least the potential for a relationship over time. The next part is the female blueprint. I like how he put it this way because there's a male blueprint, which is just be hot, show up, bring beer. Guys are visual creatures, remember that. When we talk about the alpha female. And when girls talk about it, they think it means they got a great job. What it actually means is that she's visually stimulating. And that's basically it. She's got all the stuff in the right places and it's enough to make guys head turn. That's alpha from female consideration. To quote, men need hot women. Women have a more complex blueprint. A woman is sexually aroused by successful businessmen who cause her to daydream about flying worldwide for the purpose of building successful businesses. As you can see, this is very specific and the woman will predictably come sexually aroused by men who elicit this blueprint from her. She may be totally incapable of sexual arousal for the type of guy who's the rock star. A woman who is sexually aroused by men who give her the feeling of being free and wild, for example, in the manner that a rock star or a member of a motorcycle gang might do. In this case, she will remain completely cold sexually in the company of businessmen and show biological signs of sexual arousal in the presence of a bad boy. And finally, a woman can be sexually aroused by the emotions created by going shopping and looking for red underwear for herself, especially if this happens in the company of a man who's able to describe with words the features of these clothes. We'll have more to say about such language, which we'll call the rich description. As you can see, the female sexual arousal has a wider variability when compared with male sexuality. There is a ton of these, by the way. Now, Franco's gonna talk about three main ones, which is the materialista, the adventurous, and uh, the third one evades me right now. A lot of times these things come from uh, the male dominant figure in her life, the father or the stepfather. A lot of the time, a girl will find you attractive just because she has a healthy relationship to her father and something about you reminds her of you. Could be maybe you have a scent on that he always has. Maybe it could be your voice. Maybe it can be, who knows? But it's actually kind of funny. A lot of guys, and myself included, have noticed that we meet the fathers of the girls that we're with have a lot in common. So while there's general archetypes and blueprints, which we're going to get into later in the series, there's also infinite possibilities here. Again, in the same way that women are more literarily aroused, women, men are going to be visually aroused. And how does this play out? You got to play numbers, man, because you never know. Maybe there's only one in 50 men who have a dad that kind of looks like you or kind of acts like you. You just got to find those ones. Best example for this, if you still don't understand, beards. Women love beards or women hate beards. There's no woman who's okay with the beard. It's a love-hate thing and it usually tends to come out on whichever type of male archetype she had growing up in her house or in the case of daddy issues, the opposite kind. That's why girls who had fairly overbearing, abusive type fathers like picking weak men to date because he's got nothing in common with the guy who used to, uh, well, I don't know what they did. Depends who you ask. Different topic. <music> Passivity and receptiveness, to quote, Passivity and receptiveness are essential states that the average woman needs in order to become sexually aroused. A truly feminine woman will find it difficult to become sexually aroused with a man unless he's able to make her comfortable being both passive and receptive to the man and his advances. If a woman indicates that she's become aroused by acting tough, by fighting, or by primarily visual means, similar to a man, 
we can say that her masculine behavior has either been learned or is intrinsic to the nature for biological reasons. Again, you taking charge and being sexual is really a part of it. Women are the receptive gender. They don't know when they're attracted to somebody until it's already happened. Guys have to go and make things happen. Again, I talked about it earlier in the last episode where because we have a visual representation of our sexual arousal from a very young age, we are much more in tune about what turns us on, plus the fact that it's visual. You see a good set of knockers on you, you know that kind of thing turns you on because it's visual. It's there. You understand it. Women, it's literary. They won't know till they're halfway through Fifty Shades of Grey that they're actually attracted to this stuff. I'm sure you hear a lot of times girls talk about when they cheated on their husband and slept with another guy, how they say, it just happened. I don't know. I wasn't even into him. And then it just happened. That's the thing. It To them, it actually did just happen. Now, the thing that didn't just happen was them putting themselves in a position to be attracted like that. But remember, earlier in the episode, I talked about this self-deception as a sexual strategy that women have adopted. And this is how come a girl can often sleep with a random dude. I don't know. It just happened. I have no idea. It didn't mean anything. And she 100% believes it because to her, that's exactly what happened. And you'd be surprised how many guys take those girls back. It's way more than should. But if that didn't happen, I'd be out of a job, so I can't be too hard on them. Body language and sexual arousal is the last section in here. Again, there's too many things to talk about here. Uh, Modern Life Dating John's got a great body language mastery course to go over it. There's tons of stuff out there. As long as you're willing to go and look, it's outside of the scope of this. They put a couple of cues in here. Uh, looking down after having eye contact with the male she's sexually attracted to is a clear sign of submission among all primates. Giggling is a sign of submissiveness. Emotional or dramatic outbursts. In most cases, this is a clear sign of sexual arousal in a woman. Put a pin in that. I got an anecdote for you. Impaired concentration and an increase in unrelatedness of emotions within a sentence. An increase in lower body movements which attract male attention. Blushing. Scratching of her wrists and inner arms. It's funny, the dramatic outburst on this one. Um, ask a guy dating a girl, lived together, married, whatever. Ones that have a healthy sex life. And they can tell you without a doubt that there's some nights if maybe you're too tired to smash and she was in the mood, you just know if you turn her down that night, the next day she's going to be extremely angry and cranky to you. And that's, again, a lot of guys treat that as my girl is being just a giant bitch and I can't figure it out. And that's not it. It's sexual arousal. And that's one of the ways it manifests. And that's why they call them shit tests. <laughs> so just remember that a lot of the times when your girl is busting your balls, sometimes it's just mild sexual frustration. And I can give some vitamin D to solve the problem. And so can you. They ended off on some practical advice where the mind and the body are a single system. None of this spiritual, the mind does what it does and the heart and the body, no, no, no. The body is a hormone driver and the hormone driver drives brain function. If you don't believe me, go check out a girl during her cycle and you can almost tell without a doubt, someday when she gets cranky, probably means that ant flow is coming over tomorrow. So hormones have a bigger effect than you think. Now, once you're finished this though, you're putting yourself in a position where you're able to learn the soft skills that you need to be able to not only detect arousal in women, but in order to, I don't know, I don't want to say manipulate it, but influence it into your favor as well. Again, girls love being seduced. Girls are receptive. As long as you're leading forward with a very attractive foot, you'll be surprised how much you give a girl exactly what she wants. That awesome feeling of being with a high tier guy. Don't make her feel like a slut, obviously. Now to expand on this, he talks about two different books. One is by Leal Lowndes, if I'm pronouncing that right, Undercover Sex Signals. A great book. Um, he calls it the Compendium of Sexual Mannerisms. And then the second one is Tracy Cox's Super Flirt. Again, this is like a body language encyclopedia. So if you want to look more into this stuff, there's a bunch of different sources. Like I said, those two there, plus body language mastery between the three of those things, or just plain old practice. You can practice yourself. If you see a girl doing something, is that an indicator of interest? Well, you escalate. And if you escalate, does she respond well or does she respond poorly? If you do that with enough times and enough people, you're going to kind of intuitively understand what it looks like when a girl's into you. So again, neuropsychology is a very vital part of guys running game, a guy's running game in relationships, a guy's running game single, a guy's running a game divorced, married, doesn't matter. 
Emotions run the coop. And the reason that girls are run by their emotions is because they need a level of self-deception to hide their female sexual strategy. It's not something they're trying to do. It's not because they don't like you. It's not because they're bad people. It's just the way women are wired. In the same way that guys are wired for violence and direct action, women are wired for subterfuge and self-deception. So just realize, this is why little sayings like ignore what she says and watch what she does. Because what she says isn't necessarily the truth, it's what she feels. And what she feels is always in her best interest. And I'm thinking back to the point number seven, where the girl scratches her wrist or in her arms as a display of higher value. Um, if she cuts herself, that's not a display of higher value. That's a cry for help. Uh, give her some professional help and definitely don't date her. It's not worth the hassle. I'll catch you guys later. Yeah.